Be prepared right from the start and throughout for scenes of actual drug usage and highly offensive language and behaviour. Great Britain is in the grip of an epidemic. We are one of the world's biggest users of cocaine. Quite here. It's quite strong. With young British adults consuming more than double the European average. I'm about to party. It's like one of your five a day. These days, there's not a corner of the country where you can't get hold of the Class A drug. It doesn't matter where you are, you could buy a cocaine. You know what I mean? Flick of the wrist, bro. From the couple snorting a gram with their Friday evening takeaway. Some people crack open a bottle of Bosier, though, and we'll happily sat here and sniff a gram. To the Royal Mail delivering it straight to the front doors of tech savvy teenagers. So I'm out to court, and that's it, and we will come to you. This series lifts the lid on Britain's cocaine habit. Put me right up. We get under the skin of those people who are buying, using, and selling cocaine. The nation's party goers. I've taken five lines and I'm happy days now. <laughs> Your next door neighbour. Gonna have some fun. <laughs> and our school children. What do you think of the gear, guys? Fucking bang, bang. This is Cocaine Britain. Very, very happy get out of this lifestyle and involved in it. I just watched the younger generation make the exact same mistakes that I wish I didn't make when I was back at that age. Every time we went out on a weekend, it was, you know, a case of, you know, just let's hoover up everything before we go to bed. Uh, everything just got consumed. And it's so easy to get addicted to it. Uh, and it had a negative effect on my career, on my health. I can't live without it. I don't know how to work a job. I don't know anything other than cocaine. All of the cocaine that enters the UK comes from Southern American countries and makes its way through the country. Every single line of cocaine consumed in Britain has taken a journey of several thousand miles to get here by any means possible. Land, sea and air. Our authorities are constantly having to adapt to the creative threats of the drug cartels who are finding new ways of exploiting our defences. We cannot predict exactly how much comes into the UK and how much is missed. So we know that the drug is here and we know that it's prevalent on the streets. So there's a number of different methodologies used to get cocaine here. It might be by maritime, by container ship, fast parcel for the small, little and often. Rip on, rip off, where the drugs are placed in a container or on an aircraft in the source country, arrives in the UK and the drugs removed prior to the borders and customs controls by corrupt individuals, staff within the UK. The UK Border Force team is the first line of defence against contraband coming into the country, and their approach to identifying drugs is very hands-on. We deal exclusively here with post. Now, this one's quite interesting. Maggie is a Border Force officer, protecting us against illegal goods that are mailed into the country. These are South American parcels. This is a food supplement. Maggie intercepts any package that, for her, is suspect and could be harbouring illicit goods. Approximately 10 million packages pass through her West Midlands hub each year. A greetings card, as you see inside the lining, with the workings for the card to make it sing, is a small silver foil bag. We are concerned here with we find them, we stop them, we seize them, we pass the information to the relevant people. A small press seal bag of very fine powder. Nothing is too small to test for narcotics. It's fish oil, you can smell the fish oil now. Upon opening this parcel, notice it was machine parts. There's no invoice, there's no details, there's no thank you, here's your machine part, here's your purchase. It has been x-rayed, so there was, would have been an anom anomaly seen on the x-ray. I 
found a little, well, a large pellet. So I'll test this. It's gone blue. We're looking at cocaine, cocaine hydrochloride. It gave a positive indication for the presence of cocaine. It'll be seized, it'll be secured, and all parcel details will be relayed to the relevant law enforcement agencies. We always get it first, always do. If you send it, we'll find it. No two ways about it. Not far away from this Border Force hub, West Midlands cocaine supplier Grant knows there's only so many parcels Border Force can open, and the cocaine hidden in birthday cards is just the tip of the iceberg. The lengths people will go to to get their stuff back on their shoulders is absolutely unbelievable. They're actually following Holiday Makers home. And on the last stop, on whatever campsite before the ferry home, they're sneaking up in the middle of the night, swapping a particular spare wheel on a camper van and replacing it with their own wheel, full of stock, pure cocaine, and a 40 pound disposable tracker. And they can just sit 100 miles behind it, let it cross into Britain, and retrieve it at their leisure. These people at the top understand that the border force is stretched to the limit already. So they're taking full advantage of that. Using unsuspecting members of the public as cocaine mules is a stark reminder that the suppliers and dealers will use any means necessary to get the drugs into the country, regardless of who may be affected. In the case of one smuggling operation gone wrong, Norfolk local Julian got caught up in something that would change his life forever. In this part of Norfolk, drugs are rice. I ain't gonna lie. They're everywhere. Everybody knows somebody that knows somebody that can get it, or, you know, it's absolute madness, if I'm honest. I was actually around my girlfriends. And a load of my friends, they started sending me pictures and links of what had happened. There was a big news report that a woman walking a dog had found a load of holders. They were all full of cocaine. I think it was three quarters of a ton of scattered along the shore. Just imagine you were on the beach walking your dog and you discovered millions of pounds worth of illegal drugs. Well, that's exactly what happened to Valerie McGee, who came across satchels stuffed with cocaine. I said, well, I'm going to have to go look. Even then, I had a feeling that I was going to find something. So I probably walked for about an hour, a mile or two. You can't write it in a book, could you? It was just here in front of these steps. There was cocaine laying about everywhere. Even though it was dark, I could see ahead of me somebody had opened the package and left some. So that was when I helped myself, really. <laughs> I haven't ever seen anything like it washed up before. Obviously, I was over the moon and that, that I'd found something so precious. I texted my girlfriend at the time to say that I'd found Willy Wonka's golden ticket. And that got me in so much trouble. It's unbelievable. I mean, really, it was the best and the worst thing that ever happened to me. Going through what I've been through, I wouldn't want to look for it again. Coke is just probably the worst thing to ever come into my life, really. To say it's coke, which I'm sure it is, but is it? Is it really? Because on the street, you, you can never know what the fuck you're getting. You, you don't know what, if you're getting coke, if you're getting fucking diazepam. You don't know what the fuck you're getting. Once the pure imported cocaine has reached our shores, it gets distributed all around the country to people like Grant, a cocaine wholesaler. Grant knows all the tricks of the trade to maximise profit, whilst keeping customers coming back for more. These days, it's where there's only isn't been caught. I've met solicitors, QCs, prosecutors, 
build and surveillance, air hostesses, wreck and production companies, everybody and anybody that's having a go at it. You know, I was with a police officer six months ago, sniffing copious amounts of cocaine. If you're lucky enough, you'll get some stuff off a decent day of the that speaks to organically. Failing that, who's, who's to say what you put up against? You know, could we have plant fertilizer, amphetamines, ecstasy, MDMA, whole piece of mine are bollocks. People are actually paying to put the shit up their fucking nose. People like Graham provide the cocaine that street dealers then sell on to the public. Gram by gram sales are what make up the vast majority of the UK's cocaine transactions. And dealers like Leo are on the front line of feeding the demand day in, day out. It goes mad. It's a mad thing right now. I'm talking to you like I'm probably losing shots and that right now, but. You know, I just want to let the people that know that they've got this life. You know. The girls, they fucking want, they want this thing right now just for a recreational thing, fucking get kind of wavy before they go out. <laughs> With such high demand, it really is a seller's market. And some dealers can't resist taking advantage of their clients. Get a pair of crushing it, make it just, just like the bad thing, you know what I mean? Gonna add some benzos to that. Right, watch, watch, they get that placebo effect. You know what I mean? You gotta do it real nice like that. Gotta make it look authentic, you know? You get me, you get me, bro. Hey, look at that. Mad. Look at that pure white blood. Mad. Hey, watch. And these dickers ain't never know the difference. Bro. Get that in the baggie. You know what I mean? Done. <laughs> Crazy. This baggie of paracetamol, passed off to party goes as cocaine, will sell for an unbelievable 80 pounds. On the streets, the market around cocaine, real or otherwise, is thriving. This provides our police with a daily challenge to stem the availability of cocaine by targeting the dealers and keeping the general public safe from harm. Tonight, a proactive plainclothes team from the Met Police are on patrol in the West End, keeping an eye on our capital's party goers. A lot of their work is around targeting cash point thefts, where cocaine is often used as a lure. Quite often get people, they've had a few drinks, they decide that they want a little something extra to keep the evening going. Uh, they think then it's a good time to go and purchase it from somebody on the street. When a vulnerable party goer is apprehended by a dealer telling them they have cocaine for sale, what they don't realise is the Class A drug could be used as bait to rob them. These people particularly target clubs and pubs. They're very good at selecting their victims. They surround them in numbers and intimidate the person taking their bank card, obviously seeing the ATM and put the PIN number in. Then they have access to that person's account. It's almost the perfect crime for them because the victim doesn't want to then approach police because they've been trying to buy something that is illegal. So they go unpunished. Being robbed as a result of trying to buy fake cocaine is distressing. But for many users, their concerns lie mainly with what's been mixed in with their drugs. My friend one time bought some coke apparently and it came out with like a paper and pa like pieces of paper folded up in a baggie and like the dealer just drove away and he could do nothing about it it's just like you never know what you're getting okay all right we walk up 
What do you have? What have you got? Her number just turned. 64 grand. How pure is it? It's 7 out of 10. I'm not going to say you're 7 out of 10. Right, right. 7 out of 10. But you know what I mean? I'm going to be honest with you. Yeah. But it's decent. You don't know what goes in that cocaine or what's in there. It might not even be cocaine. It might just be paracetamol. And you won't know. Or it might be something worse that can make you go crazy. How much did you say it was? Lady Pound is my Lady Pound Glamour is. Okay, and do we do it? Will we do it openly in the street? Yeah, 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 yeah. You just, you just wait at the end of the shop, I'll go and get it for you. Okay, how do I know it's a fork match or fork shake? Because some people never mix it with stuff or like cut it with it. It's a one, one draw with that shit. Because I heard, just because I heard, I heard this on the guitar. It happened, no, 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 you, yeah, yeah, it just happened. I'm not saying no. But you don't go with the wrong people. That's what I'm saying. Take it. Like some shit is so bad that you instantly know like I've I've had some shit that have like fucking soap in it or some shit like detergent like dead ass tastes like detergent bro. <laughs> so nasty. I feel like you know if it's good if like you do like the littlest amount and your whole like face is numb. That's when you know it's good. People will go. That's good. That's just the benzocaine, which is the local anaesthetic effect. You can't tell how good coke is by looking at it or looking at it. And if you believe that you can, that's probably because you've just done too much coke and you think you're far brighter than you are. In Cardiff, scientists at the NHS testing facility Wedinos know exactly what's going up your nose. We receive samples of psychoactive substances or suspected psychoactive substances from members of the public, people who perhaps are using drugs, um, but also organisations right across Wales and the wider UK. The production team passed on to Wedinos a baggie of cocaine they bought off an East London street dealer to find out exactly what was in it. We'll go down to the um, Wedinos laboratory uh, where samples are prepared for analysis. We're about reducing harms. Through the testing facility, we're able to identify trends in higher purity substances and also any cutting agents that may cause adverse effects. Within cocaine samples, primarily the bulking agents that we do tend to see are things like caffeine, lidocaine, benzocaine, but the most commonly identified substance was levamisol which is commonly used as a, a cattle dewormer. Reported side effects of levamisole include ulceration, skin lesions, and bladder cancer. Adulterated cocaine may end up causing some unpleasant side effects. But in London, another NHS facility works tirelessly to help people battling with the most common side effect, addiction. ARCH provides treatment to around 800 addicts per year. 82 of those are primary cocaine users. In terms of your cocaine use, you use once or twice over New Year's? It, it, yeah, it, yeah, it was probably a fortnightly thing still, yeah. Max is one of the key workers at ARCH. He heads up the centre's criminal justice intervention team, a team of four working solely with addicts who have been in trouble with the law. One of Max's clients is Jack, who was referred to Arch's criminal intervention team five months ago after being arrested for the possession of Class A drugs. Last year, 2017, he was arrested for a drugs-related offence. They tested him and he tested positive for cocaine. And now uh, it's mandatory for someone who tested positive in a custody suite to come to two appointments at their local drugs and alcohol service. In the five months Max has been working with Jack, his cocaine use has dropped from daily to once a fortnight. But there's still work to be done. I'm walking around in my bed and I'm just like, I'm never doing this again. This is fucking crazy. I'm like, why am I doing this to myself again? And um, two, three days later, all of that's gone. I've completely forgotten about it. That's the reason that the two appointments with the test and arrest, because you, you give them a week, you send them away and say, you know, please come back, please have a think about it. Um, and often that's already reduced within the first week. I think the relationships really helped as well, being in a, being in a strong, happy relationship. I mean, I did like a few years just of everyday con consumption, alcohol and cocaine, and then also then smoking weed to 
to bring me down from the cocaine. So yeah, being in this relationship is really, really not a message in the future. It's about normalising your drug use. And, you know, alcohol might be legal, you might see it on the telly, things like that. So that's, you know, it, but that's similar with cocaine, because if you're in a party, you know, and everyone's drinking, but everyone's using cocaine as well, no one's going to be saying to you, actually, is that a good idea? I feel no two ways about spending £40 on a ticket. And if you said £40 to go to the theatre, which is not, but for example, something like that, you'd be like, yeah. that's a bit beer. Yeah. I ain't doing that. And someone, you phone someone up for a ticket, you're just like, 40 quid, yeah, bosh, gone. No, no, no worries about that at all. So yeah, you're right. If I could, if I could take that fortnightly thing and think, well, that money that I'm spending, not just the cocaine, I mean, the booze and all, it, it turns out to be an expensive night. Back in Norfolk, and Julian's big find of a kilo of cocaine was already proving too hard to handle. The drugs are believed to have been tied to buoys by smugglers. It's thought they were swept onto the beaches by strong winds and waves, breaking their ties. Partied hard. I went on for a few months. Ended up with a habit. When you're addicted and that, you ain't really thinking deeply about consequences or you just want to party, do you know what I mean, after finding something like that throws you that deep down a rabbit hole that you just don't know who you are. And if you don't find yourself again, you'll never come out. The party ended abruptly after Julian was arrested several months after he found the cocaine. The police told me that somebody had grasped me up. Who it was, I don't know. They put me in a cell. I can't really remember so much because I was high at the time. It wasn't long before the press turned Julian into the poster boy for the washed up 50 kilos of cocaine. The paper made me out to be such a big time dealer and that, and I'm so low profile that I don't know why the police even come to my house, really, because I weren't, weren't dealing, I weren't, you know, I was only helping friends out, partying myself. Went to court, they give me a two year suspended sentence, drug rehabilitation requirement, and that's when I put myself in at the rehab clinic and started making a move towards sorting my life out, really. Since all this is washed up, I can say that I know there is an epidemic of people using now. <laughs> There's a lot of people using cocaine. I do regret that I ever touched the stuff, because it has it's ruined my whole life, really. Drugs are no good for nobody. I would like to put it all behind me, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that would be nice. Even with 50 million pounds worth of cocaine washing up on our shores, the drug cartels who dumped it in the ocean are still at large. A spokesman for the National Crime Agency has described the fines as a substantial seizure of Class A drugs and a major blow to the organised criminals involved. Julian is still the only person charged in connection with the beach cocaine. He remains in rehabilitation for his addiction. There is a fine line between habit and... Uh, What's, that? What's the word? Addiction. The job that I worked in on the city was uh, very high stress. Unfortunately, I started turning to uh, cocaine, not firstly for any recreational use. It was more to keep me awake and on edge. I think after about two years, I realised that it had a grip on me. Around those vital teenage years, you are so fragile. Like You're so open to doing everything, but you're really young and you don't really know the consequences. I've lost countless friends to it, and it's upsetting. When recreational cocaine use becomes full-blown addiction, the lives of users and those around them takes a sudden and scary turn. When Adam started displaying worrying behavior, 
his family began to record their experiences. But uh, everybody sees him. What um, makes you think there's somebody in the attic, though? Do you actually see anyone? Who's that there now, you see? There's no one there. Send your picture. There isn't. Oh, my God, isn't it? <laughs> For Adam's mother, Andrea, and grandmother, Irene, this video is a long way from the boy they once knew. He were a good kid. He were, he, we were a good baby, yeah, weren't they? Yeah. Really good baby, and he were good at school. Oh, he were a lovely kid. Ever got into trouble or anything like that? Look at that happy face. I know. For Andrea, the trouble began when her son grew up and started to behave erratically. You'd be having a conversation with him, and it's not going in. It's sort of like he's there with you, but not listening. And I think, um, it's not drink that, it's not drink. I just knew I could tell there was something different. I started to think, Andrew is doing drugs. And then his behavior got progressively worse. And my suspicions grew stronger and stronger because his behavior got quite bad. Then he started developing like psychotic episodes. He believed that people were living in the attic space. Come down here. Sorry. Sorry. Who are you talking to? Who? Look, well, come here. I'll show you. Come here. I'll show you. There's nobody there. I did confronting him, I said, there's more to this. There's more to this, Adam. I, I think you're taking something. It, it, it was calm as anything, and he just told me. He said, oh, yeah, I take cocaine. If I look back, I can't say there's a specific point. Do you know what? That From then on, his behaviour went to this. It was gradually got worse, and so it That's was right. steely, wheely, wheely, until you suddenly you were faced with this, like, different person yeah. and you think well how did we get from there to here uh -huh. the psychosis got worse and worse and worse oh. whatever is in that store that is powerful when it gets a grip of a person it gets a grip spider monkey oh, he's, he's up long, yeah. Ooh. tree monster Cocaine-induced psychosis is a real uh, severe form of mental health problem. He calls me a pussy all the time. He calls me a fucking wanker all the time. He calls me a fucking wanker 20 times because he's gone up your attic. You can have hallucinations, see things that aren't there, delusions, imagine that there are people after you and feeling quite paranoid. Well, but, you know, you blend in with trees. Oh, don't do that. Do you know what I reckon I didn't like? Yeah, just get in. No, you're not going that way. Get in. Get in. Get in. Right. Open your One point, and he had a massive, massive psychotic attack. He literally thought some gang of lads were coming to get him, and he but completely trashed his bedroom, broke everything in it, and rammed it all up against the back of the door to stop these people getting in. And he proceeded and jumped straight through his bedroom window at the height of a house. Back on patrol in central London, the Met Police are on the hunt for scammers selling fake cocaine but it's not long before they come across open class A drug use and criminality. Stand there for me. I'm not doing anything on the You're clearly doing something. You've got a crack pipe there. You've got some light. Stand there. You can't sit there. Crushed under your face. Not it. That's exactly why it's up. They've got the white bits inside the thing, please. Oh, I'm not doing anything. You're going to be searched for stolen property or articles to be used in theft. Which shop do you see? Mini printer. Excuse me, sir. Have you got any proof of where you purchased this uh, from? No. What do you use? Heroin. Yeah. Heroin? Do you use cocaine? Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, we don't think we've really got the evidence to an effect an arrest. 
without doing further inquiries at the moment. So we've taken the details of those high value goods he had on him and we'll do inquiries to see if any of the stores have really um, reported any thefts. We know who he is. He can then be circulated as wanted or we can do inquiries to arrest him in his home address. While finding evidence of crack and heroin use a stone's throw from London's tourist hotspots is shocking, it's not what they're looking for. But soon enough, they come across a suspected fake drug deal. Stay where you are, I'm going to cook you up. Guys, you're going to be searched for drugs under Section 27 of the Missy Oak Drug Act. I've seen you being led by these two down a quiet alleyway. You had your cash out. I was. Sorry. Nice. What they do is they take people like you who've had a few drinks yeah. into quiet alleyways and stuff, yeah. um, offer you drugs, yeah. and take your money. They either grab your money or they encourage you to go to the cash point with them yeah. and they rob you of your cash card. You don't the have drugs to give they give you aren't drugs. And they've crushed up paracetamol. Um, they were definitely actually One of them is known for robbery previously. Nothing to arrest them for tonight, but at least we kept those two lads safe. Unfortunately, it's not only in the films where drug dealers don't seem like they're very nice people. In reality, they aren't very nice people. From the Met's point of view, they are trying to keep people on the streets safe from harm. However, street dealer Leo thinks that's only one side of the story. I just fell into the wrong crowd, the wrong friends, and started selling drugs. I'm not a bad person. The environment that I was in at a young age, I, I was getting stereotyped and getting stopped and searched for no reason, did it? And I felt like I'm one of them. I can't, I can't get out of it. Not knowing that I had other choices. Young people as like, as young as 13, 12, whatever, selling drugs because the risk of them keep going into jail like, is is minimal. Like, you know, they're only Miners, the public, they're coming to us, they want it from us. No one went to them and put a needle in them and injected them with drugs or, or and made them sniff drugs or anything like that. It was a choice. The same way they say about drug dealers, you have a choice. Whether you sell drugs or you go on the straight and narrow, they are drug addicts. They get rehabilitation for that. So it works for them, and because it's illegal, I'm doing it, it automatically works against me. Back at Arch, key worker Max is trying to get hold of cocaine addict Jack, who hasn't kept his follow-up appointment. Hello? It's Max, you're all right. How's things? Right, OK, fine. I, I get that completely. I just wanted to make sure that you were all right and everything. Yeah, so you're staying hopeful. Good. Concerned, Max takes Jack's case to his boss, Deep T, for advice. He's not come in for, like, three weeks. So, yeah, it does, it's got to a stage where it's a bit like... How much are we going to offer him, really? I mean, we really do need to think about discharging him, don't yeah. we? Because he's yeah, not yeah. engaging. Has he had any period of abstinence? He's four weeks. He's had four weeks abstinence. Okay, that's yeah. not bad. Yeah. Um, I think the other option is just to give him a final appointment. Appointment. Say, if you Opt don't attend, yeah, if you don't attend this appointment, we will discharge you. Yeah. He can obviously come back in any time. We don't want things to go kind of stale, so to speak, because sometimes we need to take away the treatment. So if we were to dis discharge him tomorrow at this stage, there's a high risk of him relapsing back into daily use. Even for those with clinical support like Jack, the journey to get clean is an unpredictable and challenging one. But for those who are experiencing the pain of addiction without that support, it can be devastating. Andrea's son, Adam, jumped through a bedroom window when high on cocaine. 
he did land in the garden, miraculously, uninjured, which I don't even know how he did that, but he did. I cried that day outside. Adam, what are you doing to yourself? Please don't do this to us, please. I know. We tried everything, but it was it was just like you were banging your head against a brick wall, Ian. It wasn't long before Andrea was confronted by the news she'd been dreading. On that day, the 29th of November, 2016, um, I was revising with my friend at home uh, for an exam when the door burst open. And all I got were, Mum, quick, Adam's not breathing. Got round the, to, the, to the dad's house, which is only round the corner. When I got there, there were already an ambulance there. And then I just went to the bottom of the stairs and just shouted, oh, is he all right? Is he all right? And a, and a paramedic said, well, he's very, very poorly. I suggest that you get in the car and meet us at the hospital. We get to hospital and I walked in and I said, I said, Adam's just been rushed in. So this nurse, she just came up to me, right in front of me, and she just got hold of both of my hands. She took both of my hands in each of her hands and she just looked right into my eyes and she went, you, you need to come with me now, because if you don't, your son is going to die in there on his own. And when she took me through into the crash room, there were doctors, there were nurses, they were pumping on his chest, they were doing this, they were doing that. They were, his arms were right off. Oh, it was horrific. So I just went to Adam and I just got hold of his hand like that and I went, please, Adam, wake up. Please wake up. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And then they stopped. They just all stopped. And I said, what are you stopping for? Don't stop. Please don't stop. <laughs> and that's it. That's it, the call came one. <laughs> In South Wales, the Wedinos lab is analysing our sample of cocaine bought from the London street dealer to test for dangerous cutting agents. But this result reveals a very different kind of threat. So that's all done. As you can see here, it's got a very strong spike for cocaine. We can see that there's no levamazole or benzocaine within the sample. The only psychoactive substance is cocaine. For most users, the high purity of their cocaine would be a good thing, but that overlooks another alarming fact. Often people think that the adverse effects from using cocaine are as a result of um, adulterants that, that may be within there, but the high levels of purity may be the, the key factor for causing some of the adverse effects. At the time of toxicology, Adam's blood level of cocaine was 8.5. No alcohol in his system, no opiates, nothing. So just the cocaine killed him. It can result in things like cardiac arrest, leading to fatalities. In 2013, there was 169 deaths where cocaine has been listed on the death certificate. That rose to 371 in 2016. Over the last five years, people are being prosecuted for possession of cutting agents. They were like, well, these cutting agents can get us into trouble as well. So why bother using the cutting agents? So they did away with it. And now we're seeing the market largely dominated by cocaine only cocaine. I didn't realize cocaine was a killer. And I think, to be perfectly honest, a lot of the people who socially use cocaine think the same thing. They don't realise it's the killer. They don't realise that just that tiny little bit 
can kill you. For those who have been extended a lifeline through free treatment, staying the course on the road to recovery can be as challenging as admitting they have a problem in the first place. At Arch Treatment Center, Addict Jack has finally re-engaged with the program after a near four-week lapse in treatment. I met someone very special in my life, and unfortunately, due to a very stupid fucking mistake, I potentially have lost them. That's why I haven't seen Max for four weeks, because I've been trying to, I've been running around trying to work this problem out. The first week of losing this person led to a big blowout, which was alcohol and, 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 and consuming gear. But since then, it's completely tailed off and I've gone back to normal, but I'm still in the process of, of trying to rebuild the trust that this person gave me. He's kind of learned about cravings. He's learned about his triggers. He's actually been using the coping mechanisms that we learned and stuff and doing, you know, getting through the stuff that he's got going on. But his treatment never ends. I'm very grateful for going to Arch, but yeah, there was a massive apprehension, and I think there is for men. Men don't go to doctors, do they? Men don't ask for directions. Like, you do it on your own, don't you? You just get on with it. So it's almost like, yeah, you're weak, aren't you? Because you need, you need help. I did it unwillingly, but now I'm so glad I did, because the sessions that I've, that I've sat down and had with Max helped me through these, these weeks, definitely. The treatment that Jack and others in his situation receives is free through the NHS, but lands the taxpayer with an annual bill of 500 million pounds. However, that's nothing compared to the 13.9 billion pound cost of tackling drug-related crime in the UK. Dealer Leo, like many others who feed Britain's cocaine addiction, struggles to come to terms with the dangers of the criminal business he has found himself in. To a degree, his life too has been taken over by the drug. Once I step out of my house, I have to have no feeling. It's a zone. I have to go to a zone. I have to become someone different. I have to have a different kind of mentality. Anything can happen out there. People are attacking me. Someone can try to rob me. But any, anything can happen out there. So, you know, I've got to protect myself. There's people they would six feet under that, um, that are no longer with, with, with me, you know what I mean? This was going to come because this is part of the life. Whether people like it or not, it's a job. The money is an addiction. I wake up, I think about how much I need to make. I'm motivated to make money. I need to make money. Without money, I can't do anything. You know, that's how I see it, because in this society, this world, money makes the world go round, and it's true. This is Adam's phone. I can't bring myself to get rid of it. This text message is still coming through, advertising drugs for sale. These were still coming through after he died. New flake powder, best in the area. And the similar messages coming through the Thursday after he died, the Sunday after he died, one says, dial a flake, finest class A in town, most efficient suppliers in town, Merry Christmas. Delivering to all areas. <sighs> Sorry, fit, really. That just sounds like, yeah, the best in town and we will deliver. <sighs> that straw killed my son.